trust that the week has been good. I know that the Lord who has begun the good work in us, we shall complete it. Today we want to continue on the series we've been on for a few while now, from revelation to revolution. Our text is taken from Jeremiah 33 verse 3. Call on me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. Today we want to look at a specific topic. Jesus, the light of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. God is the one who invited us. He said, call on me. I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. God's call, or God's answer to our call, can come in many guises. One of which is shining its light into the darkness of our ignorance to illuminate and to give us understanding. You know, God is God. He only gives us what we need. Sometimes, when we call upon him, we don't even know what we are calling upon him for. We don't have a big picture or a perfect picture of what the whole thing is. But God knows, even before we call upon him. All he has asked us to do is to make the call. When we call, he will answer. And one of the ways that is that he answers us, he says, I will show you great things. How will he show us? Sometimes those great things are so close to us, they are near our noses, but we can't see them. Why? Because they're covered in darkness. All God does is to shine his light upon that darkness and we're able to see what we didn't know before, we're able to know. And on that basis, we are not able to attempt great things for God. And do things in his name. And we're able to accomplish great things that he has promised us. So it means that the basis of our being able to see great things, to see the wonders that God can do, is being illuminated with the light of God. That understanding that the light shines into our darkness enables us to grasp the truth of the revelation of God leading to his revolution in our lives. Just look at the Bible. The Bible is a book of revelations leading to revolution. It is this same Bible where it's like you see an harlot, a prostitute, who received the light of God and it's like that life is changed forever. We've heard about Mary Magdalene, a woman who had seven spirits within her that was cast out of her. She received the light of God into her darkness and she became a devoted follower of God. This Bible is a book of miracles, of the light of God and what that light can do. In John 8, verse, verse 12, the Bible says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the light of the world. Our Muslim brothers, they usually say, ah, there is no place where God said, I am Jesus. Uh, Jesus Christ said, I am God, serve me. Whenever you hear the word, I am, that's exactly Jesus saying, look, I am God. Because when, Jesus, when, when, when Moses, when, when he asked God, hey, who do I say is sending me to your people? He says, I am, said so. So whenever you see I am, is Jesus Christ saying, I am God. So now Jesus Christ is saying, I am the light of the world. When you see John chapter 1, he says, there, says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And that word became life, and that life is the light of Light, uh, is the light of men. And we beheld his glory. And that light shineth in darkness. And darkness does not comprehend it. Do we understand what that means? 
What he simply says is this, that when God shines his light, it doesn't matter the degree of darkness. You know, there is dark and there is dark. There was one time I woke up in, in, in a house one day. Things were so dark, I couldn't even see my nose. When things are so dark like that, you think, ah, the darkness is heavy. But God is saying to us that whenever God shines his light, it doesn't matter how dark the shade of darkness it is. It doesn't matter whether it is light shade or whether it is the darkest of the darkest. When God shines his light, it illuminates the whole thing. And what that tells us is this, I don't care what level of darkness is impacting your life. When God shines his light, God will cause his light to reverse that darkness and turn it into light. So, what are the examples? We have so many examples of people who receive the light of God into their lives. You and I, we are examples. The reason why we are here is because we understand what the light of God is. We've had the capacity to process the fact that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. But there are other examples, some extreme, some just mundane. Somebody like Paul the Apostle, we know that he used to be called Saul of Tarsus. We know what he used to do. He was, he, he was a man who was fervent in his religion. But that religion was darkness to him because it was preventing him from seeing the light. He took Jesus Christ, approaching him and said, look, I am Jesus, the one whom you persecute. I am not dead. I am alive. I am the light of the world. You need to receive me. And his eyes opened. See, Saul of Tarsus subscribed to what was going on. Oh, he never died. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Somebody else died in his place. Oh, no, no, he was a criminal. That was why he was angry. He saw Christianity as a sect, as something that is taking away, a people away from God. So he fought it with all his mind until he met Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, look, I am the one. And he said, oh, my God. And his life changed. That was somebody who received the light and his life changed around. Revelation leading to revolution. He led a revolutionary life. That's the reason why we are still reading this book still today. What about the Ethiopian man? You know the story of the Ethiopian man? It's in Acts, uh, the book of Acts. And what happened to the, to, to the man? He had just worshipped in Jerusalem. And he was returning to Ethiopia where he was, he was the, uh, the keeper of the treasury of the Ethiopian queen, Candace. And what happened? He was just by, 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 by an inn, you know, or he was just spending some time with scriptures. And he was reading Isaiah 53, where he was talking about Jesus Christ. But he didn't know. You know, the darkness that many people suffer today is the fact that we gaze into the Bible. We gaze in the scriptures but we don't meet Christ. And as he was there, the Holy Spirit led Philip. He said, that man, he needs, he's, do, he's reading something that he doesn't understand. Go and explain it to him. And he said, and Philip approached him and said, do you understand what you are reading? I, I, don't, I don't, how am I going to understand it when there's nobody to explain it to me? Oh, I, I am, this is your day. See, the person you are talking about, or you are reading there, is Jesus Christ. And he explained Jesus Christ. And the man said, look, why, what am I still doing? Why am I not baptized? Look, this is water. Baptize me. He received the light. And that revelation turned into a revolution in his life. He became the first African to become a Christian. And you know, even before the Western world brought their colonialism to Africa, Christianity had been in Ethiopia for God knows thousands of years. That meant that when that man went back, he did not keep quiet. He talked, he talked, he talked, he got converts. And on that basis, Christianity was able to be established in Africa, revolutionizing the lives of many people. Whenever we have the light of God, it is that touching our lives, we don't, we don't remain the same. It impacts our lives. So, the God who said, let there be light, in Genesis 1, and there was light. Is that same God? Why? Because the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And nothing was created except by the Word. So that same God who says, I am, 
uh, who says, let there be light, also said, I am the light of the world. And he now said something in that John 8, 12. He says that, he who follow me, who follows me, shall not walk in darkness. It is one thing for us to know the light. Many people know the light. Even Muslims know that Jesus Christ is the light. Because they know that only Jesus will come back on the last day. They know Muhammad is dead. They know there is something special about him. They just don't accept that he is God. That's where we differ. Because Jesus Christ says, I am God. Just God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. So if God has confirmed he is his son, and if Jesus Christ says, I am God, if he says that we are one, I am my father, we are one, we don't have any problem with that one. So if he said, let there be light, also said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, though he walk in darkness, he shall receive light. What that tells us is this. God has given us, or Jesus Christ, he has given us the prescription by which we can receive enlightenment. He says that we are to follow him. And when we do, we will have the light of life. The light of life. We usually mix it together. Light and life. But what he's saying is this. When the light of God shines into your life, what will result is that you become a living person. However death you have experienced, whatever the depth of darkness you are going through, when the light shines, its life will also come into your life. The light and the life of God, they walk pari passu, hand in hand. And because of that, that life is able to ignite your life and impact you. Now, let's ask ourselves. Jesus Christ has said, I am the light of the world. How does God give us light? We know he is the light. How do we benefit from this light that is the life of God? I want to take us back to our science class. As many of us as are here, I'm sure we understand what photosynthesis is. Photosynthesis is when the sunlight eats the chlorophyll and the chlorophyll is able to do its magic and then it's able to provide food for the tree. Am I right? Sun is the basis of life. Just take the sun out of our world and we are gone. So when we are talking about photosynthesis, I want us to understand that there's natural photosynthesis where the sunlight will shine on the chlorophyll and convert it to starch or food. Now, I want to introduce us, us to what I will call divine photosynthesis. If you can just imagine how it's like the natural photosynthesis work, that's exactly the way it's like the spiritual aspect also works. The light shines on the chlorophyll. The chlorophyll processes it and turns it into food or turns it into energy. The light contains energy without going into physics called photons. Photons are is like uh, they are supposed to be particles, they are supposed to be waves, whatever it is. I, I don't know that much, I'm not a scientist. Oh, well, I'm a scientist, but I'm not a physicist. But the simple fact is this when that energy that is in that photon, when it touches the physical light sensitive tissues of the, of the leaves, in the chlorophyll, something happens. God wants us to understand that because God is the light of the world, all of us, because we have that capacity installed in us, we have that grace to receive that energy that comes from God to impact our lives and we're able to process it and it becomes life in us. That's why the only thing I can call it is divine photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process of creation of food. So when the light of God eats our life, 
It synthesizes. The word synthesis means to create. So when God creates something, he's creating life in us. So the spiritual faculty that enables us to grab God's light is known as the eye. You know, I'm saying that we, are, we have capacity within us to receive the light. You know, it's not everybody that has that capacity. The reason why some people is like you talk to them about Christ, they don't have a clue. You explain to them, they don't understand. It's because they lack what you call the eye of understanding. The capacity to understand what the Spirit is saying to us. So, when we are talking about divine photosynthesis, even when God shines his light, they do not have the eye that will receive it. The understanding to be able to appropriate it, to process it, and to get the goodness that God has in that light. So, our ability to understand is what you call the eye. You know, we have physical eyes. We have spiritual eyes. Physical eyes enables us to see. Spiritual eyes enable us to see into the spirit world, to understand what is going on around us. So in order to explain this thing, Jesus Christ said in the book of Matthew 6, chapter 22, Matthew 6, 22, he said this, which sounds interesting, or even confusing. He says, the lamp of the body is the eye. What's that supposed to mean? The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. What does that mean? The lamp of the body is the eye. You see, the, the best way I can explain it is this. You know, if you don't have eye, it's very difficult for you to have what you call situational awareness, to know what is going on around you. I'm not saying that those who are blind, they don't know because they train themselves. But you as an ordinary person, if let's say you are blindfolded and then it's like you are dropped into a jungle, how are you going to get out? You won't know because you don't even know what's going on around you. So the lamp is the light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. So when we are talking about the lamp of the body being the eye. It is the eye that enables us to be able to deal with what is going on around us. When that's, that's saying that the blind leading the blind. If we are blind, we need somebody with eyes to lead us out of that situation. So when Jesus Christ was saying that the lamp is the, the lamp of the body is the eye, what he's saying is this, that without the eye, the body cannot move. Without the eye, the body cannot know where it is going. Without the eye, if the body tries to move, sooner or later, it will fall into the ditch. That is the physical eye. But now see what it now said. It says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. What does that mean? What is good eyes? What is bad eyes? In the physical, a good eye, you say, oh, one that can see 20 20. He doesn't need glasses. But even if you have heavy glasses, as long as you can see, it is still good. So, what is bad eye? You see, we have to understand that although God was talking about the physical cool eye in the first place, when he was saying that the lamp of the body is the eye, he moved on and he was talking to the supernatural realm. Where he was saying that if your eye is good, you will have light. If your eye is bad, you will have darkness. It means that if you have the capacity to receive the light of God, then it's because you have good eyes. When you lack the capacity, it's like to receive the light of God, your eye is bad. When that eye functions very good, you will be filled with the light of God. And when the light of God fills your body, the life of God fills your body. Fills your life. And that is because, that is the reason why it's like when we are so full of the revelation of God, wow, 
life changes for us. I don't know how. It's something I've experienced so many times. Sometimes I'll be thinking or I'll be reading the word of God and it's like something, God will just shine his light onto a particular page. Maybe it's something that is like that I've, I've been thinking about for, and it's like if you just jump out of me and it's like I'll be jumping. If you think that it's like I've just won, I've just won the lottery. Why? It's because when God shines his light upon his word, he turns it into rema. And that rema happens to meet the particular need that you have at that point in time. So we become enlightened. And because we are enlightened, we no longer have darkness. We no longer have ignorance. We no longer have doubt. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So in that case, because we have the light of God, faith is back within us. We are no longer, ah, what am I going to do anytime? Why? Because we have received the light. When God shines his light upon us, it excites our spirit. The same way that it's like photons excite the cells, the pho 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 photovoltaic cells of whatever is in it. You know, in this world, we see science everywhere. You just look on the roofs of people's houses, and what do you see? You see, um, what do you call uh, this thing that people now use to generate uh, solar panels? That is it. That is physics for you. Every time you see solar panels, you see it's the sun shining on it, doing its wonders and producing light. That's exactly every time. You, it's like you're thinking about God's light. You just consider your life, your heart, as that solar panel. As God shines his light upon you, it will quicken you. And when it quickens you, it's like something happens within you. The things you don't see before, you start seeing it. And then you are able to act upon it. So when God's light floods our soul, We'll be full of light and we also produce life. The reason why is that we struggle with darkness, we struggle with death, we struggle with all the negativities of life is because we have not received the right light for it. Which is the reason why when Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world, he's saying whatever your situation may be, whatever your circumstance may be, God is saying to you that, look, I have the solution to everything. There is a light for every darkness, every work of darkness. So, the eye of our understanding, that's in Ephesians 1 verse 18, Paul talked about the eye of our understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints? The eye of your understanding is what you need to be able to receive the light of God. If you are a Christian today, if it's like you indeed live the life of Christ, it's because your eyes, they have been opened. You know, as, just as the eyes of your understanding can be opened, it can also be closed. It can be shut. Somebody who does not have eye of understanding is said to be spiritually blind. Remember the story of Elisha? When the Syrians, when they came against him and they surrounded him, and, uh, the, uh, and, and his servant said, to him, Ah, master, master, we are, we, are, we are dead meat. Why? Because we are surrounded. And Elisha said, Ah, God, open his eyes. That is his eyes of understanding. And what did he see? He saw angels all about. And then he now said, God, those people that have come against us, blind them. When he says blind them, it didn't mean that they became blind physically. It simply meant that their understanding, their cognition was impacted. So they couldn't really process what they were, what, what they were seeing. So Elisha walked to them and said, so, yeah, what, what, what do you, who are you looking for? Where do you want to go? Oh, you want the man Elisha? Oh, come on, just follow me. I will take him to him. Even if they didn't know him before, if they, their understanding was there, they would have sourced that, that this is the man we were looking, and then they would have grabbed him. So what that tells us is this, that our ability to be able to fulfill God's purpose for our lives depends on the eye of our understanding being open. 
Until those eyes are open, we will just be groping in darkness. Which is the reason why is that Paul was praying for the Ephesians there. He says that the eye of your understanding shall be open so that you will be enlightened, so that you will know. You will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. What that passage, Ephesians 1, 18, what it is saying to us is this. It says that enlightenment confers on us three primary benefits. When you receive the light of God, it does three things in you. Number one, it gives you knowledge. Knowledge. When you receive the light of God, you know, we... we there is something called kairos. When you receive kairos moments, it is when it's like you, you, you gain understanding that you've not had before. I'm sure you know the story of Archimedes, the, the Greek philosopher, who when he was taking his bath, he realized that the, the, the weight, his weight in that water displaced equal amount of water and the thing fell out of his bath. You and I, we have a bath every day. How many times do we think of displacement? We just get into the place, we have a bath quickly, and we go and do a nine to, nine to five. But this man was a deep thinker. And he says, ah, hold on. The, equal, the amount of my weight is equal to the water that is getting out of this bath. And that's how displacement came about. And it was on the, on the basis of that kind of thinking that we have, for example, like, that, like sheep, is like they can sail on the sea. You know, when people started manufacturing iron ships about 100 years, 200 years ago, many people do not want to travel on them. Why? Because they said, ah, it's going to sink. Because in their own understanding, every time you put iron on water, it sinks. But once they understood the principle of displacement, these days, how many of us even travel in, in a wood, wood ship? We all travel if you have to, at least the clothes you are wearing, they, they, they came on iron ship. To understand that, it was a time, a kairos moment, a time of, it's like when things became crystal clear. Another example, John, uh, is it, is it John Newton, uh, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was sitting under an apple tree in Cambridge. And then an apple fell down. If it were you and I, what would you do? <laughs> say, Thank you, Lord, for this apple. You pick it and you eat, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he was a deep thinker and asked, why did that apple fall down? And that was how he developed the principle of gravitational force. Gravity. We've lived with it all this while. We felt its impact, but we didn't know what it was. And he identified it. Listen, the things that God will show us it's not as if God is going to manufacture them anew. They are already around us. The solutions to our problems, they are all around us. The only problem is that we have the capacity, lack the capacity to see what they are in the time that they are there. So when we are talking about enlightenment, it, is, it impacts knowledge. The kind of knowledge that you never had before. The kind of knowledge that if you are to apply it, it will cause things to change. That is revelation that leads to revolution. So, divine light is the source of knowledge. You know, the original sin was inspired by the fact that the devil promised Adam and Eve knowledge. Oh, you will see and your eyes shall be open. Man has been pursuing knowledge since the beginning of time. Why? Because knowledge is power. Knowledge is life. But there are different ways to pursue knowledge. And God is saying to us, because I am the light of the world, when you receive my light, the first thing you have is knowledge. That was what Adam and Eve, what they realized. The devil promised them light. What did he give them? 
darkness. So understand, many people, they say, oh, I'm a free thinker. I don't believe in God. That's the reason why they can't have knowledge. Whatever knowledge they have is knowledge that does not go beyond this world. When God gives us knowledge, it is a kind of knowledge that we will use in this world and that will take us to heaven. So when Paul was praying, and he says, I pray that the eye of your understanding be opened, it was because he knew that he was a recipient of that kind of prayer. We know that when we are introduced to Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, he was known as the man who was persecuting the church, killing, maiming, doing everything. And then the church started praying, God, touch that man. God, touch that man. But they never believed that even that God, God will answer their prayers. Because when God touched that man and changed him, those that, same people that were praying for him, they were running away from him. Isn't that, you see, there's nothing new. We, the church, will pray, oh, Lord, do this. Oh, Lord, do that. Oh, Lord, send your power. And when God sends the power, and we, he doesn't send in the way that we're expecting. We are the ones that reject it. But Paul knew that, look, if not for the prayers of the people, that God opened his eyes, he knew that he would never become what he became. So he was encouraging the, 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 the Ephesians, pray, God, open the eyes of my enlightenment. enlightenment. And he even prayed for himself that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Knowledge is important. And what the light of God gives us is clear knowledge of what we need to do. The second thing that you benefit from enlightenment is hope. It says that you may know what is the hope of his calling. When you have knowledge, three benefits. Knowledge, hope. When the light of God shines in you, it illuminates your life. You gain knowledge. You see, knowledge is just the beginning. You know, it talks about understanding. Wisdom is applied knowledge. Now, when you apply the knowledge that you have, what happens is that faith rises up within you because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing. The entrance of your word, it gives light, it gives understanding to the simple. So you, you are looking at an issue before, but you now gain knowledge about it. And you now know the person from whom that knowledge came from. So you are able to develop faith. And when you have faith, what now happens is this. You need to have hope. Why? Because faith is for now. Lord, I believe you have done it. But you may have to wait a few years before you get it. Now, hope is what keeps our faith alive. When you have hope, it means that you believe that what God has said, he has done, is done already. Even though you haven't seen it yet, you know it's going to come. So when you receive the light of God, you apply your knowledge of his word to you and you hold on to that word. It builds up faith within you and then it gives you hope. And the Bible says in Romans 5.5, 5, hope makes not ashamed. Hope does not make ashamed. It means that because you have hope, you, you do not care about what anybody is saying. Even Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he... He was not bothered by what God said. He was looking forward to that which God has promised him. So, enlightenment gives you knowledge. Enlightenment gives you hope. And then, enlightenment enables you to know what you have, what is working for you, as opposed to what is working against you. He says there, he says that we might have the ability, it's like, to, it's like to, 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 to understand the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Let me see. Uh, yeah, that we might understand what are the riches 
of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. First, you have knowledge. Second, you have hope. And third, you know just how rich you are. You know, the reason why we worry is because we don't think that we have the capacity to meet our needs. As I've said before, I've, I've always quoted this guy, John E. Hunter, a situation only becomes a problem when you do not have enough resource with which to meet it. If you have a bill of 5,000 coming and you only have 50 pounds, you've got a problem. Why? Because you don't have enough resource to meet it. Turn it around. You have a bill of 50 pounds coming and you have 5,000 pounds in your account. You don't even think. You don't blink. Say, take it. You don't have any problem. It might be a challenge, but you have the resource. That's exactly what it is. The enlightenment of God gives you knowledge about who God is. When you know who your God is, it doesn't matter who is against you. That creates faith in God, in you. That gives you hope in God. Hope down in God, for I shall yet praise him. Because I know the kind of God I am serving. He is the almighty God. He is the God of all the earth for whom nothing is impossible. He is the God who will fight my battle and win because he is Jehovah Sabaoth. He is Jehovah Jireh. He will supply all my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So when you are enlightened, you know who your God is. You know the riches you have in him. Many of us, we are so focused on what is against us. We are blind to what is for us. You remember the story I, I said earlier about that, uh, about Elijah and his servant. All Elijah could see were the Syrians surrounding them. I mean, all the, the, the servants could see were the Syrians surrounding them. Elijah could see the angels of innumerable, uncountable number of angels surrounding those who surrounded them. So when Paul says, pray that your eyes of understanding be open, he's saying, pray so that you can understand the resources of heaven that are at your disposal. When you know what God has in store for you, you don't worry about it. You know that he is predisposed already to giving you anything that you ask. Because he says, ask whatever you will in my name. So, when Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. He who believes in me, or who follows me, will not walk in darkness. God is saying, look, I am setting a path before you. There are other paths. There is path of darkness. There is path of worry. But if you will follow me, if you will trust in me, I can assure you will never walk in darkness. For if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ sets us free from sin. He sets us free from our troubles. God is saying, walk with me. Follow me. Do as I do. Trust God like I do. I am the light. There is no reason for you to be troubled by any darkness. God's power is able to dispel every darkness that covers you. Why? Because he is light. And his light is the life of men. When you receive that light, life will come into you. So why don't you pray today and say, God, open my eyes. Lord, you must open my eyes. Father, the eye of my understanding must work as it's supposed to. Those areas where I have issues, those where, where, where I have worries, oh Lord God, enlighten me. Shine your light, oh Lord God, into my darkness today. Oh Lord God, so that I can have peace. Shine your light so that I can walk with you. I am tired of walking in darkness. I want to walk in your light. I want to experience your light. Oh, Lord God, do great things in my life. Oh, Lord God, reveal your, your grace. Oh, Lord God, reveal your light unto me in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray.
The reason why we feel powerless is because we lack the right or the requisite knowledge to meet our situation. So why don't you ask God to the Lord God? I know knowledge is power. Empower me with your light. Let me see, O oh Lord God, what I need to see so that your glory can indeed shine in me. Open my eyes, O oh Lord God, to your wondrous truth. Because, O oh Lord God, it is the truth that I know that will set me free. Lord, glorify your name in my life today in Jesus' mighty name. The Bible says that the people who walk in darkness, they see a great light. I want you to pray. I'm sure you have people who don't know God. I'm sure there are people that you know, your family, your friends, your relatives, who do not know Christ yet. It's because their eyes of understanding have not yet been opened. Why don't you cry? Say, Lord God, your voices, those who walk in darkness, they see a great light. Wherever this person is, oh Lord God, shine your light upon them in Jesus' mighty name. Lord God, grant them even the ability that you granted somebody like Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul, and he was able to recognize you as Lord. Oh Lord, open their eyes so that they will understand, they will see you. Oh Lord God, they will appreciate you, they will accept you, and they will follow you. Lord God, let there be a revolution of salvation. Oh Lord God, in people around me in Jesus' mighty name. Shine your light upon them as you have shown it upon me and I received it. Lord God, shine your light upon them so that they will know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering and be made conformable unto your death just as I am being in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray. Oh, In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Fire, Lord God. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to say that you are our light. It is true, you are the light of the world. But it is also important that you are our light, O oh Lord God. We have received the light of salvation. We know that if we die today, we will reach with you. We know, oh Lord God, that your light is shining in our lives. But we are asking, Lord God, that we might know you more. That we might receive more knowledge of you. Because the higher the intensity of your light in us, the more we're able to accomplish for you. You are the one who said we should call upon you. You will answer us. You will show us great and mighty things. Lord, shine your light upon us and take us, Lord, to the next level. Lord, you said that if we follow you, we will never walk in darkness again. Lord, any vestige of darkness still operating in our lives, Lord, shine your light to burn them off so that, oh Lord God, your light shall be complete in our lives. Let us know you like never before. Let us see you like we have ever done, O oh Lord God, so that your glory can be seen in us. Lord, let the world know and call us children of light because your light is truly shining in our lives. Glorify your name in our lives, O oh Lord God. For in Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.